So uh, a bit about myself. Um, I'm a Tadentrop Booth team leader at CloudOn. Um, you might have seen Shachal's uh, presentation uh, yesterday. And um, I uh, love uh, new technologies. Uh, always have to have the like, latest gadgets. And, um, and uh, here's my email in case anybody wants to contact me. Feel free to just send, send an email. So um, what is interoperability? So I, I wanted to start with DocX interoperability, but then I said there's even a better example, which hasn't had, doesn't have anything to do with files. So um, let's say you come to a hotel here in Berlin, and this is the power outlet, and you have no idea how to use it. So you just go ahead and you buy this uh, nice adapter, and then you can use the power outlet here. So it's the same thing with OXM interoperability. You've got um, a person using a file, a Microsoft file on one computer, and he sends the file to a person using LibreOffice on a different computer. And you'd like the two people to be able to communicate between them with this file without losing any information. Both of the users should, should see the same thing on the screen. And they should be able to um, work with the objects and manipulate them uh, the same way they do on Microsoft Word, the same way they should be able to do it on LibreOffice. So, Interoperability is the ability to uh, communicate with a different application, a different OS, a different platform without having any data loss or without having any communication problems. Um, so just a small introduction about the docx file in case uh, some of you guys don't know uh, what the file is. So it's the Microsoft file format for uh, Word documents. And basically it's just a zip file that contains inside a series of folders and XML files. So basically it's just a bunch of XML files, each one describing something else. You've got one file that's describing the main document, and one file that's describing the headers and footers, maybe a couple of files, and you've got a file for the settings, for example, which level of zoom you want to open the document with, or, or do you have spell checking turned on or off of the document, things like that. Um, you've also got uh, web settings, footnotes and endnotes. So each of these files is in XML format. Um, so that's about the docx file. And what we're going to talk about today is, like I said, different types of interoperability problems. Um, some improvements we've done in the last year, the gaps that are still left open. Something called the matrix, which is uh, my baby. Um, I've been working on it for the past for, for two or three months, alongside with the guys from Synerzip, who have done a great job on it also. Um, some testing tools that we've developed and some of the beta observations that we've seen with our new app, uh, with our new content authoring tool that is based on LibreOffice that Chuck has presented yesterday. We've had some uh, observations and some uh, feedback from users about the usage with LibreOffice, about uh, interoperability. So I'd like to share that with you also. So let's start about interoperability problems. So basically, last year I had this slide and we had four layers inside, and since then we've developed it even more, so we have six layers today. And when I say interoperability problems, um, we classify it with six different layers. So the first one is called corrupt. That means that um, you open a file, a docx file in LibreOffice, and then you save it back without doing any change whatsoever. And when you open it back in Microsoft Office, Microsoft Office complains that the file is corrupt. It says, I cannot open this file, something is wrong with it. And it can be due to a lot of reasons. It can be something in the XML itself is broken, you, you started a tag and you didn't end it properly, or maybe you have the wrong value inside the XML, you have a negative value where it should be only positive. So a lot of different things can cause Microsoft Word to treat the files corrupted, even though sometimes LibreOffice will be a little, a little bit more forgiving. So these are the worst kind of problems that we, uh, we at CloudOn see because these problems are problems that the user doesn't necessarily know about. He uses LibreOffice, he updates the docx file, he might, might not even update it. He saves it back, he doesn't know there's any problem, but the next time he, tries to, he will try to open it in Word, um, Word will complain. So this is the most uh, troubling problem. And thankfully, there's not a lot of these problems. Um, We've managed to drop it down from 25% of the files getting corrupt to somewhere around 0.1%. So uh, that's all the work that we've done. Um, the next type of problems that we have are called crash, meaning we open a docx file in LibreOffice, LibreOffice crashes, or when we try to save it back, LibreOffice crashes. 
Um, this is also a bad problem for usability because obviously we don't want the user to use our product and it have it, having it crash. But at least here the user knows it happened. He knows something went wrong. He might have lost his information at <coughs> work, but he knows something happened. The next one is called hang, which is just what it says. The user tries to open the file or save it back, and LibreOffice just hangs because it might be it has a huge 20,000 row table in the file. It can be because uh, LibreOffice goes into some kind of infinite loop. But the bottom line is LibreOffice hangs. The next layer is called preserve, and this means we have we have some kind of data loss. It can be something to do with uh, you open the file, you save it back, and you lost a table. And it can be something that has to do with styling, like the border color of the page has changed from red to black, or the width of the table column has changed. So even inside preserve, we, we categorize it as data loss or style loss. Uh, having data loss obviously more, more um, uh, important than style loss, because Data loss, the user usually cannot recover from, while a style loss, the user can see that the table color has changed and you can change it back. But if you lost a table, you usually can't do anything besides re-enter this table. So, um, The next layer is called render. Um, this means that LibreOffice does not render the docx file the same way that Microsoft uh, renders it. And it could be because of a bug. It can be because this feature is not supported in LibreOffice because it's some kind of proprietary feature that only Microsoft uh, uses, like uh, SmartArt. Um, or it can be um, because of the uh, uh, LibreOffice doesn't yet support the feature, which is could be some um, some setting of chart, title, the position of the title, things like that, which. We, we, we ought to support, we ought to add it at some point, but we don't yet support it, so currently the title <coughs> is it in the same position as it is in Microsoft Word. So they, these are render problems, which means only affects the way the user sees the file in LibreOffice. And the last layer is called manipulate. Um, it, it basically means that the user, these are bugs with the usability, meaning the user cannot um, work with the object the same way it works with it in Word, or you cannot create the object in LibreOffice. Um, an example for this is, again, SmartArt. Um, in LibreOffice, when we open a docx file that has SmartArt, we try to do a good job of rendering it, but we render it as an image. We don't allow the user to start moving the shapes inside because we want to preserve. It's more important for us to preserve the object itself. Um, so for that, we, we simply save the entire object some kind of uh, grab bag, and we render it the best way we can as an image, but the user cannot move the shapes. So this is a manipulation problem. The user cannot change the text inside the shapes of this model. You cannot move the, sh move the shapes. You cannot change the size. So this is th that specific example is because it's something that's not supported in LibreOffice. Um, but there are other examples. Um, so these are, these are kind of the six layers of problems that we see in interoperability. And the most important for us is the preservation problem. When I say us, I mean us as, as CloudOn. Um, when we want to fix problems with interoperability, because there are thousands of them, we first focus on preserve, obviously after we have fixed all the crash, hang, and corruption, because these are not so much. There's like maybe 70 uh, crash, hang, corruption together, and maybe 500 uh, preservation problems. So, uh, we focus mostly on preserve because uh, we believe that the user's experience is affected most if he loses data, <coughs> if he loses information. Less if he can't uh, change the size of the smart art, that's less important to us. Uh, we're more concerned about the user being able to know that when he uses LibreOffice or uh, the, cat, the cloud one product that's based on LibreOffice, we want the user to know that he doesn't lose any information. He can count on this uh, application. He can count on this uh, project that he, he lose the minimal amount of information. Um, so that's just an overview of the different problems that we have. Um, and the, the next thing I want to talk about is something that I mentioned. It's called the matrix. Um, basically what it is, is it's a huge set of features that we've um, compiled that belong to Microsoft Word. And for each of these features, we tested all the different um, settings for this feature. We've 
for each of these features, we've created a synthetic file that contains a docx file that contains only that feature, a small file. And um, also, we've tested these features in, th in three different layers, preserve, render, and manipulate, meaning we opened the file in LibreOffice, saved it back, checked if the feature um, was preserved. Then we opened it, checked if the rendering looks the same the way as Microsoft Office. And the third thing we tested is, can you change this feature the same way you can with Microsoft Office? So for example, if the feature is line spacing, then you should see that the line spacing is preserved after round tripping. You should see that it looks the same line spacing as Word, and that you can change the values of the line spacing. Then we went and we did all of that against Google Docs also, so that we could have a kind of a comparison between how good LibreOffice is against the benchmark, if you want, which is Microsoft Word, and how good is it against Google Docs. Um, and also, in some level, we also tested it against Apple Pages. And um, what we've seen is that LibreOffice is much, much better than Google Docs or Apple Pages. There are certain areas where LibreOffice uh, blows them out of the park. A lot of objects, Google Docs and Apple Pages, convert to images when you import it in that into, their, into their website. And when you download it back, it, it, it's an image. So you lost your chart, you lost your smart art. Uh, sometimes shapes get converted to images. So a lot of these things, uh, LibreOffice does a lot better than both of them. And in other cases, it does uh, as good as them, if not better. So um, just to give you uh, an idea of how big this this matrix is. We've got 1,700 features in the matrix, and I remind you, for each one, we've got a synthetic file, and we've tested it in all these different levels. So, for example, if you see, you can see that the text category, we've divided into categories, uh, more or less aligned to what you have in Word. So, um, you've got text has eight subcategories and 47 features, paragraph has 36 features, you've got things like diagram, which is uh, smart art. You have 260 different features that we test. Um, shapes have 230 different um, uh, features that we test. And we also, we also test some legacy uh, features like VML, which is the older way to describe shapes in the uh, docx file, and legacy, uh, legacy forms, things like that. So um, I, I think that the, you can't find a feature in Microsoft Word right now that you can tell me that we don't have in the matrix, that we've covered it. And we keep it live all the time. Every time we fix a bug, or every time we notice that somebody in the community fixed an interoperability bug, something that was supported suddenly, we update the matrix so that we, we know at any given point what the status of LibreOffice is. Um, so just a quick screenshot of some of these. So here you can see the text. I'll just go to the simplified version. Here you can see the text category. It's not even the entire. Uh, spreadsheet. You, you only see like 40 different rows. So you can see here that you've got, you can't see here, so I'll just tell you what you see here. You see, for example, you've got bold, italic, underline color, underline style, subscript, superscript, small caps, all caps. And these columns are for LibreOffice, and this column is for Google Docs. And you can see that LibreOffice is doing a better job in all three columns, which are preserve, render, manipulate. You see that in the category called open type features, uh, we now preserve all of them while Google Docs just loses everything. Or when you have character spacing, we do a pretty good job with character spacing while Google Docs uh, sucks. So this is just the text category. You can see here the paragraph category. Again, you can see that the LibreOffice side is much greener than that. Yeah? Can you go back one slide? Sure. Uh, what's, no, no, okay, it's the other one. Uh, what's the red rectangle in the uh, down in the middle of our this, it does not work. <laughs> this is small caps. It means that we don't render small caps properly. We, specifically for this case, small caps is rendered as all caps, um, which means that all the letters are capsulated in, in the same size, while small caps should mean that only the first letter is big and the rest are capitalized but smaller. So it just renders it wrong. Um, and I think it's a bug because in, uh, I think in LibreOffice you can select small caps. It's a feature that is supported in LibreOffice. So this basically is a bug. Uh, by the way, for each of these features, we, we've created a case in our system, in our uh, ticketing system, that we track it. We, we know when are we going to fix it, if we're going to fix it, what are we going to do with it, 
Is it important to fix? Is it not? Is it used a lot? Uh, so obviously features which are less used um, by our users, we're, we're not going to give high priority over, over other features. So things like um, legacy form controls, we're not going to waste a lot of time on. While bugs and shapes and text, we're going to obviously put much more emphasis on. So this is the paragraph category. And in case I didn't, you didn't understand, so the red means no, it's not supported. The green means yes. And the yellow means partial, partial support, which means in some cases it works and in others it doesn't. So this is the paragraph. Here you can see the list. You can see the table. Again, in the table you can see that you've got here different kinds of borders. Um, the Google doesn't do a good job with. Um, and we've got deleted cells, merged cells. So uh, this is just four sheets out of the 29 sheets, category sheets that we have in the matrix. And we use it as, a, as, a, as our reference. It's kind of our Bible. How good are we? Are? What is our progress at every good point? And we also have a kind of historic reference so that we know a year ago what were the values in this table. So um, hopefully we want to share this with the community so that everybody can know at any given time what the status is. So we just need to figure out what's the best way to put all this online. Um, but uh, we want everybody to enjoy this work. Um, so after talking a bit about the matrix and the features and the different kind of problems, uh, I just wanted to talk about a bit about the workflow. Exactly what happens when a file goes in and goes out of LibreOffice, a docx file, and what are the different ways to solving these uh, interoperability bugs that we've spoken about. So, yeah. Just one question. Do you both test the uh, transitional and XML and the uh, standard? So our, we decided to focus on docx files created by Word 2010, which is a tra transition, yeah. not the script. So, um, obviously, you, could, you can. This is this is um, two two three dimensional. It's two dimensional, but you've got different sheets, so it's and you've got different times. So if you add another layer of complexity, which is different file formats, like 2013 docx versus 2007 docx, then you get it, it just gets too crazy. So um, this took three months. I guess if you want to do it for each and every different format, you'd have to create a sample file for each one and run round trip it and test it visually. And this, all of this is being manual work. It's not, there's no actual way to do it automatically to test these features. So we, we felt like we should focus on one format and know it best. And thankfully, Microsoft doesn't do too big, too many jumps between versions. So it's like 2010 is like, it's still almost what everybody uses today. So. Um, so this is basically the workflow. So you have the docx file going into the filter detector, which detects it should be used. It should be handled by the docx import filter. Then the docx import filter uses uh, Uno API to set the data model objects, and the docx export filter has direct access to the docx export filter to the data model, and it writes back to um, to the docx file. So. Basically, a problem in interoperability can be in each of these links. It can be in the import filter, because maybe we don't handle this kind of uh, XML node. It can be maybe that we're handling it, but with the wrong way. Maybe we're not analyzing this value properly. It can be with the mapping between the import filter and the data model. It can be in the export phase. Maybe we're reading it wrong, and you've seen a lot of bugs in the export filter also. So it can be in any of these phases, and it might be something that's not supported altogether. So, there are basically three ways that we can solve interoperability problems. So the first way to solve the problem is just going ahead and fully implementing this feature in LibreOffice. And for that, you have to do kind of a, there's a, uh, an online, the wiki, there's an online uh, like shopping list, what you have to do. And you basically have to do a lot of steps. You have to add it to the data model, add the mapping to the UNO handle it in the import filter, handle it in the export filter, add documentation. You have to do update the UI, the rendering, add the dialogues for manipulating this feature. It's basically a ton of work just to add maybe a small feature that nobody really uses. So um, an example is the next styles, next style. Um, it's a feature, it's a, it's a setting of a style, which means basically when you use a style and you press enter, to, to go to a new paragraph, which style should the next, par next paragraph use? So this was something that was supported by LibreOffice, 
but there was a bug in the import filter, so it, when you round trip to .docx file, that attribute of styles was lost. So um, you had to kind of make sure that the entire chain works, which meant fixing the import filter, and then it worked fine, so that was good. Um, the second method of fixing um, <coughs> interoperable problems is called grabback. It's something that was introduced um, approximately a year ago, I think, by the brush, a year ago. And it basically means that you just take your feature, you import it, you put it inside some kind of property bag that's attached to an object in LibreOffice, could be attached to a paragraph, could be attached to a shape, could be attached to the document itself. And it goes all the way through the import filter, stays in the data model with that object, and when you export, you just see, oh, I've got this property bag, let's Let's just write to the file whatever inside. So you don't have to handle the UI, you don't have to handle the rendering, you don't handle the UI and the rendering. And the drawback is that the user doesn't see the feature, but at least it's not lost. At least the feature is round trip without losing information. And we do it with different things. We do it with the smart art object that I described before, but that's an example where you do render. But in text effects like glow, shadow, uh, bevel, things like that, we don't render them because LibreOffice doesn't yet support it, but at least we save them. Um, also, style attributes. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of examples. We use it more and more now because we figure out it's best that we support, we preserve as much as possible rather than wasting the entire three months to do a full support for one feature. So um, that's the second approach. And the third approach is, I call it filter change, uh, filter behavior change. That means it's not doing full support, but it's not doing grab back. It's something else. Um, and we have, uh, we have two examples for that. One is a work that um, a collab has done for us on uh, drawing ML um, handling. Drawing ML, in case you don't know, is the newer way to describe shapes. In docx files. It was introduced in Office 2010. And um, up until a year ago, LibreOffice used to import only the older format, the VML. And um, LibreOffice did support drawing ML, but it only supported it in Impress and in Calc, but not in Writer. So basically, what, what, um, what Collabora has done is they've changed the way Writer um, imports the data. And instead of importing the older VML, they import the newer drawing ML with the same classes that are shared between Impress, Calc, and Writer. And in the export phase, they also adapted the filter so that instead of exporting VML only, it now exports both the newer drawing ML and the older VML. So it was kind of changing the filters, not exactly adding support, but just changing the way they behave. Um, also, shapes with content was something that was done, which means um, shapes like um, triangle that had inside something like a table or a circle that had inside a chart. Anything that had contents inside was imported inside Rider as a text frame, which meant that the shape properties were lost, but at least you didn't lose the content. And what was changed was now the shape itself is being imported by the drawing layer, while the contents is being imported by Rider. So you've got kind of, the, of you've got a circle with, with all the shape properties being preserved, the size and the line width and the color and everything, and the contents itself is imported by writer as a text frame inside the shape. So you don't lose the content and you don't lose the shape. So this is another example of the filter that is being changed without actually adding new support or adding anything to the data model. So, so these are the three different approaches that you can take if you want to fix some probability problems. Um, anybody have any questions before I go on about anything I said so far? Yeah. Um, in, in the test documents, how do you check the rendering? Do you use computer vision? No, like I said, all the work that has been done in the matrix was done manually. So you open oh. the file in LibreOffice and in Word and put side by side and just look. Does it look the same? And, and you have to see, a lot of times, it's some, not a lot, but some of the times it's like really subtle differences. So you, you, you really need to know your shit. You need to know what to look for. So you need to. The person doing this work, he has to know the features really well. He has to know what each feature means. So there are some kind of like strange features like um, use spacing, but not the same, but only if the previous paragraph is different than yours, things like that. So 
you, and it's just a simple checkbox, but you need to know the context of this feature that you're testing. Because if you don't understand, if I show this document to somebody else, you look at the, the, the two documents and you might say, it looks the same, I don't see any difference. But if you understand the contents in the top context, you might figure out that it, it doesn't look exactly the same. So um, it, it's a manual, manual labor. But the, the, the good news is that 99% of the work is being done already now. And now all that needs to be done is just um, uh, kind of maintaining it. So just if a feature is being fixed, you just update that line. You just rerun the test on that feature. And then you're good to go. You don't have to do the entire matrix again. Uh, unless, of course, um, the work on the compatibility will you know, be exponentially um, speeded. And then you'll have a lot of things changed. But Okay, that's the case. Any, anything else? Great, so uh, I'm going to talk about things that are being fixed. Uh, what time is it? I don't have a clock. 1.30. Ah, good. So a, a bit of uh, now, a bit of uh, eye candy, things that are being fixed in the last year. So the, 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 the people, the, the groups that we've worked with that have done this amazing job, uh, it's basically, it's Galia. Um, which is mostly Jacobo's work over there. Um, Synerzip, which is, it's, it's had an amazing, huge team of engineers that have been working for us. We've got two representatives here today, uh, Sushi and, uh, and uh, Dushin. And Calabra, which mainly uh, was work that has been done by Miklos, uh, some by Marcus, um, some by Tomas, right? Miklos? Tomas has done some of the work? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, maybe even Kendi did some work for us. Of course, you Kohei did some chart fixes. Yeah, and Kohei also, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So basically, this is the team. It's like a team of uh, all stars that have done this amazing job. And I'm just going to show examples of the things that have been fixed in, in interoperability in the past year since last conference. So um, the first thing is alternating content. Like I said, drawing the mail was being not imported, was VML was being imported, the, the, the older way to describe shapes. And uh, so after you routed the file, what happened was, I'll show you a picture. Here. So this is the original file. You can see here at the top that you've got the menu of Microsoft Word, and you've got all, this, all these cool features like the different colors, and you've got effects that you can use, and gradients and things like that. After round tripping the file through LibreOffice, um, this is the menu that you receive at the top. You lose all the effects that you can use. You can only use two-dimensional shades and kind of two-dimensional transit trans rotations, but you won't have all the newer drawing ML features. And after round trip, after the fix, now you can see that the, the menu at the top is exactly the same as the original file, which means if you have drawing ML, you didn't lose the ability to, to use all the more newer features. Um, work has been done on, on word processing groups, which basically means grouping of shapes. I have a couple of cool examples here. Here's the original file, and this is what it was round trip to LibreOffice a year ago. So you can see a lot of the grouping here is being messed up, the colors are being changed, and this is how it's being round trip today. So it looks exactly the same one to one. Another example we have here. This, sorry, this is the original file, this is a round trip one, exactly the same. And the last example I have here, you can see that the document title here is behind the other shape and you lose uh, some of the fields here at the bottom and the, you, you have here lines that go from the top to bottom that are lost and the image is plot differently and this is how it looks, and this is what it looks like today. So it's almost one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, relative size is something that has been recently fixed. Um, you can have shapes, and you can tell the shapes to have a size, not a, an absolute size, but a size which is relative to the, either the page dimensions or the margin dimensions. And here's an example of what it looked like before after round tripping. So these are the shapes that have um, uh, relative size to the page and the margins. And this is what it looked like after round tripping. And this is what it looks like today. So the shapes keep their size uh, relative. And it's not 
it's not like the size is being computed and saved as absolute f round trip. It, it keeps the it actually keeps the the, fe the feature called relativity relative size to the page. Text effects. So this is something that's not being actually rendered in LibreOffice, but after round tripping, this is what the file looked like. So you lose all the glow effect, the reflection, the shadows, um, different outlines with dashes, things like that. These are called text effects. And this is what it looks like today after round tripping. You don't lose anything. Everything is preserved, nothing is lost. This is another example. You have transformation on the text. You have uh, uh, also, here you can see the glow and the shadow, again, being preserved perfectly. Also with shape effects, you can have the same effects you can have on text. You can have on shapes. Here's an example. So this was the original file on the round trip one a year ago. You see that the effects like the the shape is 3D here, and you have effects on it, and you, you have low, and this is what it looks like today. Artistic picture effects, I'll just move on with this because nobody really uses it. Shapes with content, so that's what I talked about before. What happened is if you had a shape with content inside, it would get really messed up. So you'd lose the shape itself. Like I said, the triangle was converted to a text frame. And you'd lose, um, like you see here, is a table inside and you'd lose the colonization. Sorry. In some cases, you'd lose the chart also. Because charts weren't supported in LibreOffice a year ago. They, they were lost after import. And this is what it looks like today. Almost perfectly preserved. The chart has rounded, rounded edges. But basically, it's almost perfectly preserved. Content controls. Content controls are things like uh, document fields or check boxes, date pickers, form controls, uh, reference objects like table of contents, things like that were uh, lost. Smart art, like I said, was being con like smart art used to be converted to simple shapes, so you'd actually lose the smart art functionality, and it would just be converted to like different uh, triangles and rectangles on the document. But now it's being uh, round trip perfectly, so this is the original document, and the round trip one, you can see this is round trip one. When you click on it in Microsoft Word, you get the smart art uh, context menu, so you didn't lose anything. Themes uh, is something that is not yet supported in LibreOffice. When I say themes, I mean not the theme of the LibreOffice application itself, but themes of the document, which means you can type in text, you can, and then you can change the theme of the document and the entire fonts change, the sizes change, the colors change, even table borders, uh, colors change. Um, so the theme controls all of it. So up until today, after you round trip the file, you lose both the theme the inside the file and the themes on the objects themselves. So today, after round tripping, and these are different examples of themes of theme attributes. So you have font type, font color, paragraph color, shading, table style. Um, OK, charts. Like I said, charts were being lost. And today, after round tripping, charts are being uh, preserved. There's still a lot of work to be done on charts because there are a lot of features inside charts, things to do with the legend position, the title position, the size of the plot, um, axis labels, things like that. Um, yeah. What about uh, text what on the charts descriptions? So text uh, text what uh, what? So uh, I, I I need to check the matrix to, to tell you if text wrap is being supported because I'm sure it's there. But I don't know to tell you off by heart if it's being preserved or not. But but the problem here was that the chart itself was being lost. You lose the chart. That that happened during the import itself, meaning when you open the file you didn't see the chart anymore. So today, at least, you preserve it, but it doesn't look exactly the same. The size is a bit different. Specific chart types aren't supported yet. So like, uh, I think radar, radar chart, things like that. But at least for most users, it's good enough. Not interesting, because nobody uses it, but it's working. Not interesting. Cropped images being preserved now. 
And besides all the things that I said, we've done a lot more besides that that I just didn't have enough energy to put screenshots for. So you've got here embedded objects, table styles, uh, things to do with track changes on tables, um, latent styles, which nobody knows what, mean, what it means. Um, citations, bibliography, a lot of other cool stuff is now supported, it was not supported a year ago. Um, so, like you see, a lot of stuff has been improved in the last year, but still there are still gaps remaining. So, um, this is where we need you. We need the community to add more support and more effort into this, because the gaps that remain are still pretty big, but it's much better than what it was a year ago. So the first one is, like I said, regarding charts. Um, these are different things in charts that are not being preserved perfectly. So you see the chart size is lost. Different effects, like we mentioned before, like glowing or reflection or bevel, things like that, effects on the chart itself or on the title are being lost. Uh, customizations like the position of the axis, the legend, the title, is it on top of the chart, is it inside the chart, these are not yet being Preserved and uh, these different chart types um, are not are being lost or converted to, to other char chart types. Um, the second one is um, forms. So it's something that I don't know how many users use today, but it's important to let you guys know that it's it, it has it doesn't have good uh, good interoperability. Meaning a lot of these legacy form controls are just being either converted to simple text or just being lost. So, um, and also ActiveX controls, um, they're being lost also. So. Uh, fields, yeah, I did have a good picture for that, so I'll just put a picture of the field. Um, so you've got different document fields that are being converted to simple text, and not, they don't preserve their field, fieldness, um, like title, author, uh, other fields that nobody really uses, but still they're not supported. Um, review. Um, so that two, th two things fall under review. The first one is track changes. In LibreOffice we call this redlining. So there are apparently a lot of different types of redlining in the, in the docx, in the OXML format. So there's not just let's insert text and delete text. There's also the ability to move text from one place to the other. There's the ability to move paragraphs. Uh, you can delete content controls and insert content controls and Funny enough, they have their own way of describing this was inserted and deleted. It's not exact. It's not the same as we've inserted and deleted text. Um, different uh, redlining inside the math control. So you can have inside a docx document, you can have the math formula. So if you had track changes turned on and you deleted um, some of the formula, it should be um, represented in the file. If, and today, these changes are lost. So. It's, I think this is the most tricky, these are the most tricky ones to support right now because it, it, it requires a kind of deep work inside the data model. Um, but I think it's important even for LibreOffice itself, not just for, not just for compatibility with uh, Microsoft Office, but for LibreOffice users to be able to track changes not only in text, but in all, in all these different features. Um, it's important to have the support. Uh, content controls, uh, like I showed before, things like uh, combo box, um, different document properties, these are being lost. Uh, group shapes, so group shapes today are being, um, are losing a lot of information inside. So not only this, the attributes of the group shapes, shapes themselves, but also if you have complex content inside the group shapes, uh, uh, you, you have different kind of problems with that, so things are getting lost inside. And besides all the things I've said, we have other gaps like mail merge, restricted editing, signatures in the file, Canvas support, old style email shapes, uh, age background. So these are all the areas that any of you guys can jump in and do a fantastic job in. So, um, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. Um, I want to talk about two testing tools that we've developed um, that we'd like to share with the community. And we need to figure out the best way to do it, but uh, hopefully it could be used to better find problems with the each release or each daily build. 
And these two testing tools, um, the first one is called the visual comparison tool. Basically what this tool does is it, it gets a, a bucket of files. You can define the files you can. We, we've got 15,000 files that we use as the buckets for these, uh, these tools. And what the tool does is it automatically takes a file, round trips it through LibreOffice, meaning does open save as docx, then takes the original docx file, the round trip one, opens both of them in Microsoft Word, creates XPS images for each page of these files, converts these files to PNG images, and then for each page it does uh, uh, an image matching uh, function to check are these images identical uh, or are they not. And we're using this tool to, first of all, understand um, how many pages match, meaning how good is the preservation, the round tripping. Also, we use it to find trends. Are we improving with time? So if we find out that a month ago we had 72% match, and today we have 74% match, we know we're doing a good job. We're improving with time. And the last thing we use the tool for is finding regressions, meaning we can know that um, if uh, somebody added a new feature, which wasn't supported so far, he might have mistakenly um, added some kind of corruption problem that uh, stores the file wrong, and we suddenly see a spike in corrupted files. So this tool also enables us to find, catch these regressions as soon as possible, not waiting for a month or two before we know about them, because it constantly tests 15,000 files. Um, it's not perfect, uh, because there are a lot of small differences between images. Sometimes on the same machine, the same file generates a pixel, one pixel different image. Um, but we use it basically to see the big picture, to see are we doing better, are we doing worse, is there some kind of regression. Um, also, this tool doesn't allow us to understand if there's any kind of functionality problem. It only checks the visuality. Does the file round trip look the same as the original file? Um, the other tool we use is called the feature extraction tool, which is a tool that um, instead of looking at the images themselves, it looks at the contents of the file, the XML itself. And what it has is it has a list of approximately, I think, 1,500 lines. And each line represents a feature. Um, and it's, it's largely based on the matrix. And each feature has a description of the XML that comprises that feature. And what the tool does is, for each feature, it goes over the 15,000 files, and it checks, did this feature exist in the original file? And if so, did it exist in the round trip file? And then we were able to know for each feature, um, for example, line spacing, we know that it, out of the 15,000 files, it existed in 750 of them, originally, and in the round trip one, it existed in 729. So we know, more or less, we do a good job of line spacing. But if we see digital signature, for example, which is represented by an XML node called ASIG, for example, we see that it existed in 520 files in the original ones, and in the round trip ones, it existed in zero. So we know this feature is not supported. It's not being round trip at all. So again, the same as with the, the other tool, this tool has problems also because um, the tool does not check the context, the context of the feature. It does not check if the feature in the round trip file is in exactly the same place it was in the original file. And it also, um, there are different kind of things like default values and sometimes the feature is not in the original file but it is in the round trip one but it's not a problem because it's a default value. So. Again, with this, feature, with this tool, um, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but we use the tool to know kind of anything above 90% is probably working perfectly fine. Anything under 10% is probably not preserved. So, and we also we compare the results with previous ones like a week ago, two weeks ago, so that we suddenly know there's some kind of degradation. We see that suddenly something that was supported 90% has dropped now to 20%, so there's probably some kind of bug that was introduced in the last week or two weeks that caused this feature to suddenly be not supported as good. So these two tools are um, almost fully automatic, and we'd very much like to, to share this with the community and somehow see if there's a way to 
add this either to the tinder boxes or to or to some kind of daily build machine that, that will be able to test the daily builds and see uh, on any given day how well is it being uh, improved um, is there any kind of, is there any kind of regression so that the entire community can benefit from it and know if there is suddenly a problem let's go fix it immediately instead of waiting week to week a month um, so here are the two tools um, the last thing I want to talk about is the, the observation we had from our beta with the cloud on product. So um, basically what we did is we added analytics into our product that kind of tracked um, all the unsupported features, or almost all the unsupported features, features that we know are being lost in LibreOffice and subsequently in our product. And we used these analytics to understand how many um, files are being opened that contain these unsupported features. And so we wanted to know which features should be prioritized over others, so that we know these are the features that users are using the most. And you can see that the ones that we have uh, found out were that, for example, content controls inside header footers appear to be 4% of the files. Um, shapes in headers and footers, which we didn't know were, that, were being used that much, were being used by 2% of the files, and were being lost. So we've given these things high priority, and since this, since I made this slide, we've already fixed them. It's already fixed in the master. And we can see other examples like deleted cells and tables, um, OLE, embedded OLE objects, uh, document protection, uh, different kind of track changes. So, but you can see that the, the numbers, the percentages are going really drastically down. So this is under 10 to a percent. So, um, Another thing that, we, that we, we've noticed is complaints from users. I personally expected a lot of complaints um, because users were used to Microsoft Office and we switched them to LibreOffice. So I was expecting complaints about interoperability. But funny enough, we've only received a handful of complaints out of tens of five, thousands of users that have used the product. And um, these complaints were about, for example, why don't you have hyphenation yet? Uh, we're, we're losing content control items. We can't select or deselect them. And bibliographic citation and tabulation aren't working properly. So um, I guess it's good news because I expected people to, to lose a lot more or complain about losing a lot more information. And I guess the work that has gone gone into interoperability in the last year was probably focused on the, really, on the things users use the most that we, we, all, we saw almost no complaints. Um, so that goes also to say on the LibreOffice product itself that users that use it, they, 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 they don't suffer as much as I thought they would suffer uh, of interoperability. Um, so that's it. Um, Anybody has any more questions? Just let me put this slide on. Yeah. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Um, you referred to uh, when you did the last comparison, everything was fine and equal. So which LibreOffice version did you use for these last things? For the for the for our product? Yes. Um, we try to use the latest version, so the master. Okay. That's what we use. Yeah, anything else? Yeah? Uh, one in the back first. Do you have any plans to switch to OBF? Two? Excuse me? To switch to OBF. So we're not switching anything. We're, we're letting the user open the file that he wants to open. So he has access to his Dropbox, his Google Drive, his OneDrive, his Box account. So um, the user can open DocX files with it. I'm not sure if he can open ODT files. I'm not sure, but. I don't, definitely I don't see any problem. There's no technical problem allowing the user to open OTT file. I don't know if it's yet available in the app itself, if we've added that feature, but technically there's no problem opening it. Can I add to this to your yeah, answer? Yeah, here's the, the product manager, so you know. So, one of, if you want to have people use LibreOffice more and more, uh, it's one of the things I discuss in my presentation. You want to keep this as an open environment. Asking for people to now convert their, export their documents to different formats will just push them away. Okay. So if, they're, if they have this, this, the format they used to work, their company is working with DocX, 
Let them use that format. ODF, ODT, we also want to support it, and there's no reason why not to. But we just don't want people to export and import. That pain is not needed. <laughs> so basically what he says is, we don't want to force the users to convert one file to the other. We want to let them use whatever they want. They want to use docx, let them use docx. They want to use OET, but they can use OET again. Yeah. So I guess you can create a new file in it, in the editor, so it would be... No, no, you can, you can create Of course you can create a new yeah, file. Yeah, but, you know, like, if you create a new file, you can use a juice if you want a Microsoft Word file or a LibreOffice file. <coughs> yeah, so I'm not sure how it's handled the uh, shadow. Well, that's a good question. Uh, we'll have to answer it once we s complete the switch to linear editor. Right now, the default is docx. But there's no reason why it shouldn't be default should be anything else. Or we'll give the option to the user to choose. Yeah, I think uh, what happens is that uh, if you have a desktop environment, and that's if there is an organization that is switching to uh, LibreOffice. And now one of the problems it might have, and I have the uh, interesting uh, session in the morning that uh, Microsoft has problem with supporting the ODF, not on the, the other way around with the mobility. So such organization might want to ensure that once these people are opening files, even within the organization, but on the mobile devices, they are not uh, kind of uh, having really problems because they are opening it, uh, one of the tools that does not support well ODF. Um, so I think um, it's very good that uh, once LibreOffice comes to mobile, that we can support the, uh, the, the, the audio format uh, on the mobile devices. And then let the people also the, the, the opportunity to save it in this format and, and not just on the desktop. So definitely I think that's a good point. I think this is the kind of thing that we want to, to do and uh, can help LibreOffice to uh, spread it uh, because uh, the more it's being used and, it, and by organization, the more they need to make sure that nobody else is, you know, uh, uh, broke, breaking the, the, the file and the compatibility of the ODF itself. Yeah. Uh, a few questions. Uh, you mentioned that you run testing around it, so you create uh, docx, rewrite uh, LibreOffice, and re compare. Yeah. All in the in the Microsoft Office. Yeah. You mean you're, you're talking about the matrix, the word? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, did you consider just checking the the display in the Office, just the first half of this? So what what, what uh, compare the Microsoft original and the LibreOffice presentation? Yeah. So we do that when we want to test the rendering. So okay. we we compare the rendering in Microsoft Office. The original file with the one open in LibreOffice, the way LibreOffice renders it. So we do test the rendering. Only when I say preservation, we test the preservation itself in Microsoft Office because we want to do an end-to-end -end check to make sure that nothing is lost going through LibreOffice. Okay. So that is the first question. And if you compare the uh, original and the processing, Rapture. you generate bitmaps? The PNGs, yeah. PNGs, and you compare that them Pixel by pixel? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that has, it causes a different problem because sometimes you've got, for example, even if you have a file with 100, uh, line, 100 pages in it, and these buckets have, we have, when I said 15,000 files, it's comprised of different buckets. So 10, 12,000 of these are real life files that are downloaded from the internet, like real, real people's files. And we've got another 2,000 files from the matrix, which are synthetic files. And we've got 2,000 more files that we've collected from Bugzilla. So we've kind of got different, file, different kinds of files. And if you think of it, if you have a file with 100 pages, and you have one uh, unnecessary uh, paragraph at the top of the file after round shipping, it will ruin the whole comparison of the whole file, because everything will be shifted down one line. When you, can, when you compare the images. So we have these problems. And that's why I said that we use this more to see enough on a specific file. I'm talking about the visual comparison to the one that's round tripping and checks the images. We don't use it, uh, we, we less use it for a specific file and more to see the trend. So if there's an, a, if there's an un, unwanted paragraph there, 
it will probably be there the next time we run it, so the file will stay the same. But suddenly, if we fix it, we'll see that the comparison results will suddenly be better because suddenly 100 pages will match. So we see it more as a trend for all the files, not for a specific file. But we do use it sometimes because we have different criteria in the system, so we can tell the system, give me a list of all the files that had less than 50% match. And then we kind of, uh, we kind of minimize it from 15,000 files to 200 problematic files. And we know that we need to focus on these first because these had 0% match or 10% match. So we can use the system to kind of find the worst ones, but we, we to see the big picture, we, we usually look at the, the entire result of all the files again. Yeah? The matrix is just extremely wonderful. And I love to use it to help recruit people to your office, and that will help everyone here. So, how soon do you publish it? So, so, so uh, very soon. We, um, first of all, the matrix contains two, two things. Um, it contains the, the, the mapping of the feature, of course, and uh, the gaps. And also, it contains uh, files that have been used to test. So the first thing that we want to do is to, to give the files and to see how we can use them in the specific in the pressure system. And, and the matrix itself, I think we need, uh, the problem that we have also internally is the, the way we kind of manage this and update. So it's uh, also kind of um, infrastructure and logistics that we need to decide. And once we do this, I think we can share it. So it's a very soon. Hopefully it can help everybody. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much.